Tamil Nadu is going into a polls in the first phase of Lok Sabha elections that is on April 19 and joining us now for a quick election conversation uh, both about uh, national politics and state politics is Tamil Nadu's IT Minister Palnivel Tyagarajan. So thank you for talking to us and my first question naturally would be uh, how is the reception among public when you uh, go uh, seek votes for uh, the Communist Party candidate Asu Venkatesan in Madurai? Uh, how is the mood among public and the last time in 2019 uh, the one seat the DMK was not able to win in Tamil Nadu was the parliamentary constituency. So what is the GMK's plan to ensure that they are going to win all seats this time including Taini? Well, there are at least three different questions there so let me answer one. At first let me just say that the reason I am giving you this interview, I have already declined about half a dozen national level interviews on the specific topic of electoral bonds because of various reasons. If you want I will explain more. But uh, the reason I'm giving you this interview is that you've been asking me for an interview for three months and I said wait till the elections are upon us, otherwise there's no real reason for an interview. So now I'm fulfilling my long-standing commitment and giving you the interview. Uh, as far as this election is concerned, of course one starts with one's own constituency because that's where I have the greatest feel. I'm on the ground every day. So in this election I would say I have far greater comfort than I had in the last election. In the last election though we won massively in the end, uh, I was not that confident that we would win that well. I knew we would win. I thought we would win by 8 or 9 percent. Across the state we won by about 22 odd percent and in Madurai we won by about 13, 14 percent. This election I am more confident that in Madurai we will win closer to the state average and the state average will be at least the same as last time, about 22 percent over the nearest rival. So I am quite sanguine and because last time Thaini was a extreme exception. It was uh, in hundred ways. I don't want to get into it because it will be uh, considered uh, unnecessary politicking. But Taini was an extreme exception in many ways and uh, even then it was a small margin of victory, about 30 or 40,000 votes. Because you see in the first past the post system, when a statewide average across 39 seats is 22.3 odd percent, is very very, very, very unlikely mathematically that you'll have one seat where they have actually won, where, where the opponent who is down 22 percent plus on average is actually up. So that was extreme aberration. This time we'll not have that aberration. This time we'll win all 39, including Thaini. Sir, I specifically wanted to talk to you about the electoral bonds. The last time we had a conversation about electoral bonds, uh, the SBI had not put out the unique serial numbers attached to you know, each of the electoral bonds, but this time that data is out. So after the unique serial numbers are you know, put out by SBI, uh, did you have a look at the uh, donors and receivers list and what is your uh, perception of the bigger picture here? Disheartening to me to see how greatly the system has been hijacked for the benefits of one party and its two leaders basically who seem to be controlling everything. And so, you know, in my own perception, the revelations are so, like, depressing. Till now we used to talk about, are we, uh, is this election really a referendum on the future of democracy? Is this the election where we will save or we will see the collapse of India as we know it and Indian democracy as we know it? These revelations tell me that maybe it's already dead. Maybe what we are really here in this election is the wake. You know what a wake is? It's the ceremony in the Irish tradition where after somebody has died, everybody gets together to remember the good times and remember the, you know. So whether this election is actually a wake for a dead democracy is how bad this data is showing because it shows such extreme one-sidedness, such extreme quid pro quo, such blatant violation of level playing field of fairness that and, and therefore the consequences of such dramatic loss to the exchequer everybody who's you know actually done something wrong suddenly goes over to the other side or pays money and then the state doesn't get the money they're supposed to get the state meaning the, the government so it, it's so depressing to me that I'm seriously wondering are we at the kind of knife edge democracy saved or not, are we really at the wake of the dead democracy at this point? And the only hope we have is like in the Periya Puranam, you know, Trinavakara sir uh, revives the son of his disciple who is bitten by a snake and, uh, and dies. You know, are we only left with the hope of resurrection uh, and we are really at the wake? 
Uh, sir, the Prime Minister has recently responded uh, to the accusation of uh, using uh, central investigative agencies to extort money from uh, you know corporate companies. So this was an accusation that's been around for a while now since the electoral uh, bond scheme was called unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So now uh, the PM is uh, you know responding to this and telling that uh, uh, it is in fact not the truth. Generally, I don't pay that much attention to what the Prime Minister speaks. I can't understand Hindi that well. And I'm, I'm not a great believer that it's of uh, great original content. So, you know, I've said this before, I say it again. I normally don't uh, listen or don't watch and don't pay that much attention. So I don't, I don't know exactly what he said. So irrespective of who said what, the defense that is generally coming in from the BJP is that we are not using central investigative agencies for our own political gains. The agencies, be it the ED, CBI or income tax, they are acting independently. The government doesn't interfere in their functioning is what they are telling. Uh, long ago when I was a young man, I used to study as a graduate student uh, a master's degree in something called operations research and I was a graduate teaching assistant. So I used to lecture about things called simulation and stochastic modeling. Stochastic modeling means the p modeling of probability and non-deterministic scenarios. How do you gauge the chances of something? How do you calculate how many passengers are likely to get on a train in a traffic system? Uh, so what my understanding of probability is, the odds that we have seen, the outcomes that we have seen, that is only non-BJP people get targeted for these raids. Not a single person in the BJP is ever touched by any of these raids. All those who are targeted eventually end up contributing electoral bonds to the party or joining the party like um, politicians in Maharashtra like Ajit Power, like Praful Patel and suddenly start getting clean chits. And the minute they go into the BJP, all of a sudden, all of the, or into the electoral bonds, all of their cases go into cold storage. As a result of which, less than 0.5% of the cases of the ED have gone through to actual prosecution or conviction. The odds of all this happening were the ED to be truly independent is the odds of you winning uh, $100 billion in a lottery ticket after paying $1. Right? It is beyond the realm of possibility that this pattern of outcomes can be explained in a neutral, independent agency operation. I'll just stop there. So do you think apart from uh, the central investigative agencies, the conduct of uh, the SBI and the election commission has also uh, fallen under question in recent times? Yeah, I mean, there are two different things. The election commission was already playing a one-side game in many ways and now it has become so blatant. But it's, it's it, you know... One side game is half the problem, or three quarters of the problem. Grotesque incompetence is the remaining part of the problem. Look at the election commission, right? 2004 election. Do you know how long it took between the first phase and the last phase? Still 545 seats right, in the parliament. In 2004, the technology that was available was less. The manpower the mobilization capability was less. The budget allocated to the election commission was less. Do you know how long the entire Lok Sabha election took? 20 days. Here we have a Lok Sabha election 20 years later that is announced on March 16th and is going to go to counting on June 4th. It is grotesque incompetence. It is abominable incompetence, right? Just think about it. To run one election, they need three months almost between announcement and counting. And this is the same genius government that is talking about one nation, one election, running all the way from every local body and panchayat and corporation and every state and all the country all at the same time. If it takes three months for 545 seats, it will take one and a half years to run one nation, one election. You don't have to worry about different model codes of conduct. You'll be one and a half years in election for every five years. It's ridiculous. So the election commission, the less we say about it, the better. They are perversely incompetent. They can't even publish a Form 17 properly. You know what the Form 17 is, the actual votes polled. So because people started showing the discrepancy between the Form 17 and the Form 20, they stopped publishing the Form 17 altogether. Right? They have loosened every rule in the book. The kinds of model code of conduct that applies to us, how is it that the government of India is able to announce increases in the MN Rega wages under model code of conduct? How is it the model code of conduct says that ministers in Tamil Nadu cannot use their vehicles or their flags, but the chief, prime minister is traveling around in a helicopter? to do political campaign. So the less we say about the election commission, the better. It is a stain on our democracy. The election commission is a farce and a, uh, basically a 
uh, what do you say, a hollow straw man. Okay? If you go to SBI, now we have a new level of problem. Because the SBI has never before, which is a regulated bank that is taking public deposits, the SBI has become such a stooge of the government. They have submitted so many false affidavits. They have said they couldn't get the data till June. Then they showed up with the data. Then it had discrepancy. Then it had infirmity. Then they say 600 and something crores. They can't tell who the identity of the buyer is. Anybody goes to deposit 100 rupees, the KYC requirement is so high. They say you can buy 600 and something crores worth of bonds from them without telling, knowing, with them knowing who the buyer is. So the fact that the SBI has become a stooge of the government, a bank with public deposits doesn't see itself as the citizens' bank, but rather the, the government stooge. That is the real fear when I say maybe democracy is already dead and we are only seeing the last nails being hammered into the coffin, rather than that it's on the precipice of dead or not. Sir, the Congress is accusing the BJP of indulging in tax terrorism. Uh, this after the income tax uh, served them a notice demanding 1,800 crores. And the Congress is, al is also uh, alleging that all their bank accounts are frozen. So they are telling that we don't have the funds to even fight the upcoming you know, parliamentary elections. We are uh, fundless. On the other hand, the BJP is of the opinion that we are not directing the income tax to do this. Like the income tax is an independent agency and they are acting independently. We cannot be connected, you know, uh, this is what they are telling. But uh, Congress is the major opposition party in India nationally. So uh, the major opposition party of India, uh, you know, uh, to have their accounts frozen and uh, to allege that the ruling government is indulging in tax terrorism against them, how do we look at it? Look, there are probably four or five different questions in that also. The first I'm saying is the notion that these agencies are acting independently is risible. It's, it's beyond laughable. It's ridiculous. It insults the intelligence of the average person if you say that they're acting independently because mathematically the odds of this outcome for independent action is exactly zero, precisely zero. The second question here is, National party versus not national party. I'm saying that no party is truly a national party. Every party is present in 16, 18, 20, at most is the biggest parties, and the rest of us are one, two state parties. In fact, I have my own issues with the notion of national parties because national parties have so many internal contradictions. The BJP is okay with beef and Christianity in the northeast and in Goa, but you can get killed for transporting cows in Uttar Pradesh. So every party has these internal contradictions. Regional parties are much more likely to be internally consistent. So this notion of national party or special status for national party, I'm not actually a big buyer of that. Now you say that, yes, there are a lot of demands and a lot of negative actions against everybody who's an opponent of the ruling regime. I ask a simple question. Everybody is relatively learned, right? These days there's an internet, everybody can see anything. So if you're sitting on top of government and you have all these agencies and all these things in your control, and if you were truly strong, if you were truly in the mind that you're going to win 400 seats, would you be seeing these kinds of actions which are clearly perceived to be biased, right? If I'm really strong, if I'm really in control, if I'm really thinking I'm going to win 400 out of 540 seats, I should be making sure that the process is perceived to be as neutral as possible, as level playing field as possible. It should be like Caesar's wife, above suspicion, above reproach. That's what strength projects. When you have the opposite happening, when you have ruling party chief ministers being jailed, when you have agencies being uh, you know, used to send such draconian notices for 30 years back, 20 years back and all that, it is to me a sign that somehow this notion of bravado that we are at 370, 400 and all that, the actions are counter to that. Normally people who are very weak and nervous will take these kinds of actions that are clearly in neutral people's minds, likely to arouse suspicion, likely to arouse the charges of favoritism or uh, not level playing field or uh, intimidation or uh, those kinds of behaviors. So something doesn't gel, right? If they're really at 37400, if I was in the seat and I thought I was really 37400, I would go out of my way to make sure the process was spick and span, perfectly level, no action by any agency. I would have said in model code of conduct, nobody can act, no IT, no ED, no CBI. Everybody's prosecution will wait 45 days or 60 days. Let the election be over, then we'll do all these things. Right? So yeah, I'll leave it to you. I, I'm just saying, if I was in a shoe that I thought I'm going to win 370 or 400, 
That's what I would do. Because I'm not living in a vacuum. I'm living in a country of 1.4 billion people. Many of them are educated. Many of them are well informed. They can interpret and read their own things. A lot of Indians vote with their heart, not with their head. So there's also the risk of having backlash. We are also living in an international market and an international kind of economy. The rest of the world is also seeing what's happening. Just because I own the local media doesn't mean I can suppress the facts from coming out. So an intelligent perspective on this would have been, if I'm really capable of winning, let me show the pristine, perfect, 100% neutral election. And let me get the credit for being so strong and so powerful that even in such an election, I won 370 or 400. Sir, in Tamil Nadu, the BJP is claiming that the actual competition here is between BJP and DMK. But on the other hand, the ADMK is also claiming that the competition is between them and DMK. So who is the DMK's actual competitor in Tamil Nadu? And what is your opinion on the performance of ADMK in recent times, the performance and presence of ADMK? Look, I generally don't comment on other people's comments or other people's views, right? My own view is that this is still a Dravidian state and it is still a Dravidian political, uh, what can I say, battleground, right? Time will tell us, right, what happens. As I say, I'm already sanguine that I'm saying we are winning 39 of 39 and we'll uh, match or beat the margin of last time. After that, everything else... You, I'll just say gently that this is a Dravidian state. It, is, it has been a Dravidian state for decades. It will continue to be a Dravidian state for the foreseeable future. Sir, Kachatheva has once again become a controversy. Now the BJP is alleging that in 1974, uh, the DMK and the uh, Congress colluded and gave away Kachatheva to Sri Lanka without much efforts. Like, the Congress was very lethargic in its approach towards Kachatheva and at that time the DMK was in power. Uh, late uh, Mr. Karunanithi, he was the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. And without fighting a lot, without you know putting in much efforts, the DMK also gave in uh, with the Congress and they gave away Kachatheva is what the accusation is. Look, 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 I, I'm a busy man. I'm in the middle of a campaign. I don't have the time to do this water battery and stuff about 50 or 70 year old problems. Who signed the agreement to give Bangladesh rights to a bunch of land in India? Which government? Who said, I'll show La Lang to China and kept mum when the Chinese army encroached thousands and thousands of square kilometers in the northeast? Which minister said, how can I do anything against them? They are an economic superpower the same external affairs minister. I don't have the time to play this kind of petty, ignorant politics. Please leave me out. I have other things to do. Sir, the one a poll promise that the DMK is yet to fulfill, one key poll promise is getting an exemption for Tamil Nadu from NEET examination. So the opposition parties, be it the BJP or the ADMK, they are consistently attacking the DMK over this. They are telling that the DMK promised that they are going to uh, exempt, get an exemption uh, from NEET examination for Tamil Nadu as soon as they come to power. But it's been three years, but nothing has happened. Look, the, if it's not been fulfilled, it's because this governor, who is the most anti-democratic governor, who I, I agree wholeheartedly with the chief minister, if he had an iota of shame, he would have resigned and left his job, shameless, is sitting on the bill and keeping on refusing to sign it. And then when he finally gets trapped by the Supreme Court saying, what do you think your job is? He sends it to the president and she refuses to sign it. And she has done the same for a lot of bills in Kerala. And Kerala has taken her to the Supreme Court. So, if we have not been able to fulfill the poll promise, it's because anti-constitutional activities are being done at the governor's and the president's office against the will of the legislature. How can we be held accountable for that? Right? It's like, it's like, it's like I do the job. Then some dictator decides to prevent the bill from getting signed. Then you say it's your fault. What more can I do than pass the bill? Sir, apart from the bills, what is your comment on the governor's other actions? Like he's refused to read out the customary address prepared to him by the government in assembly. He also refused to swear in Mr. Ponmudi back into the cabinet until the Supreme Court intervened. So what is your comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand the basic logic, right? Like, it's so distressing to me that here is a gentleman who's supposed to be in high office. He's supposed to be representing the majesty of democracy, upholding the values of the Constitution. He gives the most bizarre, almost insane interpretation of his actions. He comes, he's supposed to read the statement given to him by the government. That has been decided in 100 cases. 
starting with 1970s governor of uh, west bengal reading the uh, a couple of words less or more and the supreme court has opined again and again the governor has no discretion under the constitution he has to read the address given to him by the government the same way he has to take the bill given by the assembly and pass it not sit on it for 8 months or nine so every action he makes is completely anti constitutional that is the first sin but what makes it cardinal sin what makes it unforgivable sin after that is that this gentleman supposedly educated supposedly passed some exam and all that goes on to say on public record i cannot do this because it will be against constitutional morality he doesn't get to interpret constitutional morality individually that has been interpreted by the courts multiple times including recently rapping him on the knuckle saying what are you doing sitting on these bills constitutional morality is not his personal subject or his personal interpretation it has been interpreted around the country across 75 years constitutional <laughs> morality requires me to do this my personal morality my personal conviction my personal mindset is that i cannot do it my conscience doesn't allow me to do it that i can believe i can give him even respect i can say self respect his conscience prevents him from even doing something that the constitution requires him to do let him say that and ideally let him resign because why should he sit in a seat that is against his conscience and do something that is within the constitution so every time he fails to obey the constitution every time he fails to comply with the constitution anybody with basic iq and basic rationality would say my conscience prevents me from doing what the constitution requires me to do therefore i am resigning this job and walking away instead he blatantly violates the constitution and then goes ahead and says it's against the constitution for me to do this i mean like as i as i said somewhere else it's like a thief saying i steal because not stealing would be against the indian penal code the indian penal code says you shall not steal then he steals and says no, no i steal because it would be against the indian penal code how is making sense is completely senseless right sir what do you think about the ram mandir inauguration because uh, when the inauguration happened one of the uh, complaints from the dmk was that you know a temple should not be inaugurated before its construction works are completely over but the bjp is doing so in case of ram mandir because they want to achieve a few political goals so what are these uh, political goals and uh, do you think the inauguration of ram mandir uh, before even its construction work, work was completely over so do you think it's right Yeah, listen. I don't know what the DMK said. I don't know what anybody else said. I am a temple goer myself, and my family has a long association over centuries with temples, including the Madurai Meenakshi Amman Temple, and decades with things like Sabri Malai. So I follow the temple news for the sake of temple news, not because of politics. And I, my memory is that a lot of uh, Sankaracharyas and uh, uh, senior people of Hinduism did not attend the temple because they said it's not yet ready for consecration. that much i remember unless you tell me my facts are wrong that's my lasting impression of whether it was appropriate for inauguration or not i don't want to get into the politics of it i believe that religion and politics should stay far apart